No one could have predicted this confluence of events just a few months ago, beginning with COVID-19, the ensuing economic crisis, then the death of George Floyd, and now the seismic street protests driving a sea change in public consciousness. CEOs across the corporate landscape have added their voices to the discussion and are determined to use their influence to make lasting change. Corporations are in a unique position and indeed are often expected to address is issues of racial injustice and social unrest. For over a hundred years, the conference board has helped the world's leading companies and society at large navigate crises and develop reasoned solutions for our country. We have from our very earliest days advocated for decent working conditions, for the rights of women entering the workplace, for the rights of people with disabilities entering the workplace, and other challenges in creating a fair and respectful workplace for all. Given recent events, we're launching a series of CEO forums to foster action called Building a More Civil and Just Society, featuring CEOs and business leaders from across American industry who will focus on the actionable insights to address our societal challenges. Today, we're very fortunate to have with us Tom McInerney, the President, Chief Executive Officer, and a Director of Genworth. He joined Genworth in January of 2013 from the Boston Consulting Group, where he served as a senior advisor, providing consulting and advisory services to leading insurance and financial services companies in the United States and Canada. Prior to that, he spent more than 30 years working in various senior executive roles with ING and Aetna. For many years, he's been active with the American Council of Life Insurers Board and the Chief Executive Officer Committees. He received his Bachelor's of Economics from Colgate University and an MBA from the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth College. Tom, thank you so much for joining me today. Rebecca, it's my pleasure. It's a very important topic and I'm very pleased to be with you. Well, thank you. I, I, I'm looking forward to your, your insights and some of your thoughts as a, as a CEO on, on this particular set of challenges. So let, let me ask this question. You know, there's been a lot of attention to DNI issues for decades. And there are many who would argue that we have certainly made great progress, but I think as many would argue that we have quite a ways to go. Can, can you speak to some of the, the tangible progress that we made as well as from your vantage point, what some of the challenges are to continuing that progress? Rebecca, I think we clearly have made progress over the last several decades. I, I would say I, I feel better about the progress in terms of gender diversity than I do in terms of ethnic and minority uh, improvement. Uh, if you look at many companies, Fortune 500 companies like Genworth, look at their board senior management teams, I think they are more diverse. Uh, it's something like 35%, uh, almost approaching 40% in terms of the Fortune 500 boards have, have women on the board. I, I'm not so sure if we had that uh, review in terms of minorities that, that we'd be as pleased as we are. So I think we've made progress. I'm pleased with the progress. Uh, we have a number of uh, women in our senior management team. We're roughly 50-50. Uh, we have three women on our board. So I, I am uh, optimistic, but there's a lot more work to do, particularly in, in promoting and giving significant opportunities at the highest levels within companies and our boards uh, to African-Americans and other minorities. You know, I, I think there are some, uh, some instances of, of real challenges that make it difficult to have the, the kind of uh, levels of participation from many different groups that we would all like. When you think about some of the challenges that are inherent in that process, what would you point to? You know, Rebecca, Genworth uh, is based in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, we were founded as the, the predecessor company, Life of Virginia in 1871, so certainly shortly after the Civil War. Uh, and, and I can tell in our organization that people who were born and raised in, in this part of the country do have some of these uh, embedded issues with people who are not like them, did not grow up in their circles. And I, I believe that uh, in general, as human beings, we tend to like to surround ourselves with people who look like us, have similar backgrounds. It's just natural. And that's what we have to really break through. And, and I think that's the biggest challenge uh, is trying to make everybody feel comfortable with everybody, no matter if they're different or not. 
And to me, it's, uh, it, it's somewhat against human nature, but uh, having been focused on these issues for a long time, I, I actually think it can become a very uplifting experience to just be around people that are very diverse, have different opinions, different uh, challenges, different opportunities in their lifetime and how they've overcome that. I think you can learn a lot uh, from a, a diverse set of people. And so I, but I, I, I think we have to find a way to push people out of their comfort zones so that they do open up uh, to people who have different backgrounds than they do. Yeah. No, Tom, I think that's right. I mean, there's a, a great deal to be said for um, looking for those uh, shared experiences and shared um, projects that are done in a workplace, but it's also about getting to know people as people. And, um, you know, when you think about as a, as a CEO, when you think about the issue of diversity, inclusion, or fairness in, in the workplace, how, did, how do you frame that? What, what, is, what is the way in which you, you come to the table to discuss these issues? You know, Rebecca, over my career, I've, I've run insurance and investment businesses in about 40 countries around the world. And what I've always sensed is to be successful uh, and to have your employees uh, feel like they're being successful, you ultimately have to reflect the societies in which you live and work. And I think that means for all levels of companies at the board level, the very top C-suite level, the next levels, really to have a broad, diverse, inclusive set of, of people from all uh, walks of life, all backgrounds, women, minorities, different people of different ages, uh, come from different parts of the country or the world. Uh, and, and I believe that uh, generally, if you want to be successful, you have to mirror the society, the customer base, uh, that is who you're trying to sell your products and services to. So I ultimately have said for a long time that uh, in order for me to feel that my company, Genworth, at this point is successful, we need to be at every level of the company, board, senior management, and the rest of the layers, all the way down to entry-level employees, to generally be representative of the society at, at large. We have some of our biggest businesses in the U.S. Uh, the U.S. itself is probably one of the more diverse countries. And uh, so I think uh, there's a lot of opportunity there, but even in other countries around the world that I've overseen, I think generally, if you can have your employee base from entry level all the way to the top and the people that oversee the companies on boards, thinking like society in general, looking like society in general uh, and trying to market our goods and services, whatever our, mission or purposes as a company to the broad set of uh, the, con the consumers, citizens uh, in our markets. I think we can be much better companies. And I ultimately think uh, we become much better people the more open we are to live and work and try to develop great products and services to improve the lives of, uh, if we're talking about the U.S., all Americans, if we're talking about uh, other countries, uh, the people in those countries. So, Tom, clearly um, one of the challenges to having representation at all levels is that the challenge of women or minorities uh, or underrepresented uh, groups coming uh, off of the leadership track or coming out of the system uh, at earlier points in their career. And so when you start to lose, let's say, women or people of color from the pipeline, uh, unless that's corrected at any company, you, you know what you know that it will be increasingly difficult to have good representation at the top. I wondered if you could share some specifics around some of the things that that have been done or that you are doing at Genworth that that helps to address sort of this um, representation issue or or to bring people along and to really create the the diverse uh, environment that that I I know we all are, are looking to build. Yeah, well, I'll just talk about Genworth first and then maybe go back uh, and give a couple of examples uh, in my prior companies. So at Genworth, you know, I came in January of 2013 uh, as CEO and we had eight direct reports to the CEO then, the normal C-suite uh, uh, kind of executives, all were white men between 50 and 60. And I found that to be very surprising in 2013 to find 
a senior leadership team like that. I, I'd never really experienced that in my prior companies. I'm very proud to say today uh, that over time, both from hiring from outside and promoting people from within, we're about 50-50 now, men and women. Uh, and we have uh, increased the minority representation. So we have three core businesses, uh, a U.S. mortgage insurance business, an Australian mortgage insurance business, and a U.S. life insurance business. And the U.S. mortgage insurance business, uh, the CEO, operating leader, uh, is Rohit Gupta. So he and his family come from India. Uh, our CFO in Australia uh, is a uh, woman who's had a very successful uh, track record, uh, Paulette, and we're you know very pleased to have her. She's doing a great job. And then our U.S. life business is uh, is run by David O'Leary, uh, you know, someone I've worked with for a long time. So we feel we made good progress on the, at the operating level, not so much on our board. As I've said, uh, we've had uh, several women on our board. Uh, we're trying to recruit uh, African American and other minorities to the board. We've we've come close a few times, but we're turned down. Thanks, Tom. Can you share a little bit about some of the work you and your senior leadership team is doing to foster a culture of inclusion, uh, thinking about the employee experience, and then also some of the HR policies or programs that specifically deal with issues of fairness and equity and inclusion? Well, I think it's very important uh, to make all employees feel comfortable uh, when they come into, into work, particularly when, we're, when we all get back to, to work as normal. And, and we have uh, very much promoted employee resource groups. Uh, we fund them uh, significantly. Uh, we have a senior executive, either myself, uh, I'm the sponsor for the African-American Employee Resource Group, but every one of my uh, senior uh, direct reports, eight of us, support different uh, uh, groups uh, from women, LGBTQ group, uh, veterans, uh, Hispanics, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that the, the whole purpose of what we're trying to do there is make feel, people feel comfortable that we care about them, we care about their culture, uh, some of the things that are important to them. We celebrate all kinds of holidays uh, for all those different groups. Uh, and and I, th I think that helps a lot. We do give opportunities uh, to, to be chair of those uh, uh, executive resource groups or vice chairs or secretaries or treasurers. So uh, particularly for employees that aren't yet in the management level in their day jobs, but they do gain some of those leadership experiences. We do an awful lot of training uh, to promote diversity and inclusion, to go through what it can feel like to be a minority uh, or in a group of a very small group uh, within a larger company uh, and how that feels every day. Uh, we, do, we do, as part of that training, role playing. So we put different uh, people uh, people that we would say are the majority white men uh, play the roles of, of different groups. And, and I, we try to make it as realistic as you can in the training exercise. And, and I do think it gives everybody a sense for more empathy and what it's like uh, to be on the other side. With the, the George Floyd situation and, and many of the others, uh, we did have a, a number of worldwide webcasts in addition to uh, many employees. We have about 3,000 employees in the U.S., but we have employees uh, in Australia, Mexico, and India. And we did a worldwide web where we actually had uh, seven people that were all uh, minority women or in those resource groups. And we had two African-American women who, who actually in their job are facilitators and they actually facilitated the meeting. All of the senior team, including me, was was part of that webcast that was on a Zoom uh, like today, uh, but they liked it. And they, they really asked basic questions, including how do you feel? Give us some examples where at Genworth you felt uncomfortable. And, and they did that. I, I, you know, I think it brought uh, it home to a lot of us that even though I, I would say, I think Genworth uh, and our employees would generally say we do a good job uh, on diversity and inclusion issues, but, but we're nowhere near where we need to be. And there still is 
as much as you try to, to manage it. You know, there are people who, who do feel that they're not, not always uh, uh, feel that they're able to express themselves. And so hopefully we, we intend to do about every month one of these worldwide webcasts with a different topic, all generally connected to diversity and inclusion. How do people get ahead? And one, you know, the interesting thing, I, I was not allowed to be a speaker. I, I was allowed to ask a question in the chat. Uh, and, and I did ask the, the question because there were people who said they felt that in some cases when they were uh, feeling that a manager was not respecting them, that there was no consequence. Uh, and so one of the things we committed to as part of that is we need to be much better. We need to hold people accountable uh, and, and, and be what we say we are, which is there's no tolerance, uh, you know, one and you're done. Uh, and, and maybe we didn't always live up to that. So uh, I, I do think we got very high marks for that. Uh, I, I believe that our uh, employee base, one, is feeling comfortable working remotely. And maybe it's a little easier on a Zoom when you're not face-to-face -face in a room of 200 people uh, talking. It's easier to, to really say what you think. And there were, you know, a number of uh, our employees, and, and a couple of them were managers, uh, were very emotional. And I think uh, our colleagues really felt that. So I, I do think that it's a constant effort to show that you have empathy for everybody, you respect everybody, you embrace differences, and we want everybody to be open and inclusive, and we want people to learn. And when they don't do things, perhaps the best way they could have done things in a circumstance, to be open, open to calling themselves on it and saying, yeah, I could have handled that situation better. And I want to get some more training, do some more role playing, so I can get better uh, at uh, being empathetic and uh, helping all of the people who work with or for me feel comfortable about my leadership. Yeah, I, I appreciate your sharing that, uh, Tom. I think it is, uh, it is the first step is actually to, to ask the questions and to listen. And it sounds as though you've taken the company even more forward in terms of addressing the kinds of things that you hear. I, I wondered if you had more advice for other senior leaders who are looking to try to have what is for most Americans a very difficult conversation around race and inequity and, and a variety of related topics. So any other words of advice for corporate leaders or CEOs like yourself? I think the most important thing, and you mentioned this, Rebecca, is the more senior you are to talk less about these issues and listen more. Uh, I, I can't tell you how humbling it is uh, when you hear, and, and this is something I, I have always uh, prided myself on, uh, trying to have a diverse and inclusive workforce. And I have to say, I was surprised uh, that in this session where all of the seven employees felt comfortable, they were, it was facilitated by two African-American women, and they just felt, felt comfortable saying and given, giving some examples, no names, of what happened to them. Uh, and also uh, people outside of work. Uh, I, I know I was listening to Roger Ferguson, who's the CEO of TI Corrupt the other day, saying how many times he's been in restaurants and mistaken for he's African-American for being a waiter or, or staff. And, and I think we have to be aware that that's real to people. Uh, you know, I'm a, a, a white uh, man in my 60s. Uh, and even and even though uh, I've always tried to do the right thing, I, I know I haven't done enough, and I know I I always have to do more. And, and I I do think that senior leaders can get comfortable that uh, they're doing training, they're having employee resource groups, they're increasing their diversity in term at all levels of the company. They can you know show metrics that show that more women. Uh, are making it to the top levels, including the board, same with minorities uh, or other people of, of diverse groups. But I, I still think even in the positive uh, work environments, there's still a lot of challenges that go unnoticed 
the slights that you don't really feel unless you happen to be somebody that's part of one of those uh, minority uh, groups or you're different than uh, other people. And so I, I just think that you can never do enough as an executive team. And, and I think being less uh, at the front talking about the issues, but having others, particularly diverse uh, employees from different levels that are comfortable uh, in, you, you know, in front of others expressing themselves uh, and listening to that and, li and trying to have empathy for what that must feel like. And then how can the company uh, do better in, in those situations? So it, to me, uh, there's still a lot of work and a lot of additional room for improvement. I, I think that the first step, just as you say, is, is to listen and then to take action. And that, uh, that is a difficult process and not an easy one, but it sounds as though there are many things that you've reviewed and taken a look at at, at Genworth to see how could you continue in the journey? And that's, that's, I think, where all of us start in our organizations and continue on. I wondered if in these closing moments we have together, if there was additional advice you might have for, for a board, for example, or for perhaps younger leaders coming up through the ranks in their organization and the ways in which they can hope to impact uh, change and to drive the conversation forward. Well, I think it's a responsibility of the board and the CEO to make sure that at every level of the company, uh, we have leaders who are diverse and to ultimately have as a long, as a long-term goal, which can't take too long to get there uh, at all levels, you generally are representative of the society in, in general. And I think for younger leaders uh, coming up, I, I am optimistic. I do think if I compare my parents' generation, you know, my parents were in that greatest generation. A lot to be said for that generation. Maybe diversity and inclusion wasn't uh, one of their strengths. You know, I'm in the middle of the baby boomers. I think we're somewhat better than our parents. I think our kids and our grandkids have the opportunity uh, to be more open, more accepting of diversity and inclusion. And I do think that. Uh, leaders, as they're moving up in an organization, need to have a focus on this topic. And I believe that if for them to be successful, both in delivering, you know, revenues and profits to their companies, uh, they're going to have they're going to have to ha surround themselves with the best teams possible, the most diverse teams possible. There's so many. You know, BCG, where I was, has done studies to show. Uh, you know, that diverse management teams, uh, almost 20% higher revenue on average, and the McKinsey, many others have, have done similar studies. And I do think that uh, I have more hope for the next level uh, of managers, the generation that are my three daughters uh, are in, that they are generally uh, more open and they care more about societal issues. They care more about fairness and equality. Uh, and I think they're more open uh, to give everybody uh, an opportunity to be part of the team. And, and so I am, uh, I would say, frustrated because I think we could have made more progress. Hopefully what's going on today uh, in the aftermath of what happened to George Floyd and, and several others, uh, that there's much more focus because I, in the end, Talk is talk, and ultimately you have to uh, have evidence and whatever metrics you keep uh, that you are making real progress and that everybody in your organization uh, is feeling more comfortable today than they, they used to feel and continue that momentum. I, I'm, I'm optimistic that the next generation will be better than my generation on these issues. I, I think that's spot on. I, I think when you, you look at the business leaders who are raising their voices and we are speaking as one is important, but ultimately, just as you say, it's the actions that we take that will result in the lasting change that we seek. And I think what's encouraging is not only the generational shifts, because this is a generation coming into the workplace 
in particular that will demand authenticity and transparency. But business leaders in partnership with human capital leaders have a, a real ability to make significant progress toward equality and equity and fairness and opportunity by the choices that are made across the spectrum of human resources programs and policies. Thank you, Tom, Thank you for sharing your experiences and insights. And it was indeed a pleasure to chat with you today. Rebecca, thank you very much. I'm very pleased that you asked me to participate in this discussion today on this very important topic that will, uh, it's important today, will continue to be extremely important in terms of how we provide more opportunities for a better life for everybody in this country and everybody around the world. I, I think that's right. And corporations can do a lot to help make the impact on the societal change that we seek. Just thank you, Tom, and, and thank you to all who are listening today. Uh, I encourage you to uh, experience the many other um, videos that we have and insights that we have from our um, wide variety of voices. And please visit our website and take advantage of the materials and insights and the really incredible, heartfelt, personal stories that folks are telling. Thank you again, Tom, and thank you.